Dr. Charmaine Jackson, I'm a sociologist uh, in the sociology and anthropology department here at Stetson. Um, so for today's uh, panel, we have a couple of Stetson students um, who had some interesting um, encounters and experiences uh, in um, participating in protests, in particular protests that address uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and what I think really makes their stories uh, unique is that not only did they participate in those protests, um, but they were also met uh, with uh, counter protesters and uh, sort of thinking about the ways in which uh, we participate in our um, political process. And one of those uh, elements is um, is participating in uh, protest and in, in nonviolent protest uh, when we are trying to assert we as a populace our uh, rights um, or to speak uh, to our government uh, or other bodies um, about issues that we feel very uh, passionately and we're looking for different types and kinds of um, platforms. Um, but what I think is particularly interesting about the activities um, of our panelists is that they um, really demonstrate something that I have been thinking a lot about, uh, which is this idea of racial courage. Um, so what what is it to really speak and think about, speak to and think about um, being courageous, uh, especially in these times as we seek uh, racial justice in the United States? Um, and. And recently, I had assigned, um, I'm teaching an FSEM and uh, it's a freshman, or first year, sorry, seminar. Um, and I had asked some of my students to think about um, courage. What are some of the elements of courage? And, and we read an article that was published in Psychology Today from um, August of 2012, uh, published by uh, Melanie Greenberg, a PhD. And she talks about six attributes of courage. Um, and I just kind of want to go through each of these attributes because I think uh, these attributes are kind of um, an interesting way to think about being courageous. Like what, what in fact um, does that mean? Uh, and I think, uh, so in the first one, feeling fear yet choosing to act. Um, and so this is, uh, embodied, um, and in this article, she provides uh, different kinds of um, quotes. Uh, there's an, a proverb that she offers, fear and courage are brothers. Uh, and so this sort of relationship of overcoming one's fear um, as something that we might mark as courageous. The second one is following your heart. Um, and so how, how do we follow our heart? Um, and see where it leads us, even if it means uh, doing something we wouldn't ordinarily choose to do. The third, persevering in the face of adversity. Um, and so this is one in which uh, even though uh, we might not feel we might succeed, we still do try, right? Um, having courage enough to go uh, into situations uh, that um, that seemed daunting. So another quote gives from Mark Twain is, it is not the size of the dog in the fight, uh, it is the size of the fight in the dog, right? So this sort of um, embody, or that statement kind of uh, carries through that sentiment. Um, number four, standing up for what is right. Um, and here we have another, she has a number of quotes, but uh, Speak your mind, even if your voice shakes, um, by Maggie Kuhn, a social activist, or anger is the pre prelude to courage, Eric Hoffer. Um, so uh, being able to take a stand and, and stand for, for what, what might be right. Number five is expanding your horizons and letting go of the familiar. Hmm. Um, and so that is getting into terrain that you might not, might not be used to. Uh, and so uh, that, uh, oh, I thought there was six, it must have been five. Oh, 
Yep, that was the last one here. Um, all right, so uh, those are some ways we might think about courage. I must miss, be missing the sixth one, but um, I think that gives us a kind of a, uh, an overview of thinking about being courageous and what does it mean to sort of um, practice uh, courage in these times as we seek racial justice or um, stories of racial courage. So um, our panelists are students uh, who have been participating uh, in protests um, over the summer and have had different experiences uh, engaging uh, and talking, um, uh, engaging and participating in, in protests where uh, the protests that they were a part of, uh, they were uh, in a majority group uh, and in, in other settings, in fact, they um, were uh, um, perhaps confronted equally or over overwhelmed by um, counter protesters. So, um, uh, I will go ahead and, um, and turn it over to our students um, who we have Simone and Amelia um, and to see here uh, sort of their experiences as we um, continue this conversation. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and begin uh, with Amelia. Amelia? Hello. Hi. Um, so, uh, so you participated uh, in some protests over the summer. Can you just talk a yes, little bit about, yeah, can you talk a little bit about um, yourself first, where you're from, and sort of what prompted you uh, to, to, to take part in this? Sure. So I'm Amelia Cara Burbridge. I'm a junior sociology major, and I'm from Burlington, North Carolina, which for those who aren't familiar with it, it's about an hour west of Raleigh. It's a very small, um, what you would expect from a southern town. Um, and as far as my experiences with protests and counter protesters, um, back when all of the protests started um, months ago, around May, I attended my first protest, which was in Durham, North Carolina. Um, not my first protest ever, but for, uh, for uh, these purposes. Um, and I went with a friend who had actually just been to a different protest in uh, Raleigh the previous night. Um, and that was interesting attending the protest while also hearing about her experiences uh, because she was tear gassed and she was also talking about the comparison of demographics between um, the protests that she had been to and then the one that we were uh, currently attending as far as um, the Durham protest being much larger, but also much whiter, which was interesting about the comparison of uh, police force and uh, just police presence. Um, and then when we were there, it was a gathering about of a thousand protesters and we were met with some counter protesters uh, during the initial gathering before the march. Uh, those people were met with very unhappy um, Black Lives Matter protesters and there was a bit of a standoff there and they pretty quickly um, left the area. Uh, but following that protest, I uh, attended another one that was more close to home. Um, it was in Graham, North Carolina, right next to my town. Um, that protest I attended with my mom and my sister and they actually, um, they attended the, the protest from the beginning. They marched about mile and a half um, that ended in front of the Graham Courthouse, um, which is especially significant because there's a Confederate statue um, in front of the courthouse. And I was unfortunately not able to be with them during the march. So I actually drove directly to the courthouse and didn't park quite um, in the most convenient location because I had a very a uh, direct experience with the counter protesters as uh, there was a group of about probably 100 to 150 of them um, kind of next to the Black Lives Matter protesters and I in order to reach my mom and my sister had to walk uh, through the crowd actually uh, which made me a little bit uncomfortable it was a weird experience just kind of literally being sort of inside the other side if that makes sense um, that was interesting uh, and I definitely got some looks I think because I was dressed up 
obviously for the Black Lives Matter protests, not for the counter protests. And there were a lot of Confederate flags um, and a lot of uh, angry looking people. Um, but um, that's that was on both sides. So then I finally reached my mom and my sister and we stood there and while uh, we were uh, standing there for our gathering after the march that lasted about an hour and a half, two hours. During that entire time, um, the counter protesters were ringing a old uh, bell that's right beside the courthouse. Um, it's a memorial of some sort, uh, but they were very persistent with the ringing of the bell during the entire gathering, um, during the speeches and such, uh, but we did have speakers to the microphone, so we were a bit louder. Um, uh, sorry? Um, oh, no. Yep. Go ahead. Go okay, ahead. Sorry. I have some questions, but I'll go ahead and allow you to, to keep, to, to continue your story. Go okay, ahead. Okay, just yeah. let me know. Yeah. Um, so then following the actual official uh, protest when the uh, everything was uh, gathered and such, um, there was sort of a standoff between the protesters and the counter protesters as people sort of filtered out they a lot of them sort of walked past this whole wall of uh counter protesters and there was quite high tensions um a lot of raised voices and uh there was actually a line of policemen um with bikes kind of creating a barricade between the two groups um it's probably significant to mention that they were facing uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters, sort of like with their backs to the counter protesters, which I thought was an interesting observation. Um, and basically standing there, there were a lot of very aggressive uh, comments thrown back and forth. And I had a very kind of jarring, interesting experience when I was sort of scanning the crowd of counter protesters. Um, and my eyes kind of skipped over a little group until I noticed a little movement um, by an area. And it was one of my old high school classmates waving at me. And it was actually a group. Wow. Um, it was a, an older brother and a little brother that I went to high school with and some of their friends. So that was, that was an interesting experience and kind of brought me back to the moment in a way. Um, and then, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. I don't want to cut you off, sorry. Um, uh, following that, uh, we actually, my uh, mom and my sister and I had a little trouble leaving the protest because by that point, we had uh, cops, uh, again, between uh, the protesters and counter protesters, but then there were also a kind of barricade of cops, uh, policemen uh, protecting the Confederate statue. So that was kind of an intersection and we were sort of locked in and didn't really know how to get out. So we had to go sort of around the block to leave but that was a very interesting experience and definitely very memorable um for my summer wow um that is an incredible story um thank you for sharing that amelia um there's so many interesting parts to your story so first of all you had two different kinds of encounters um with protests um yeah. And so how do you think um, being in a protest uh, where you have another group uh, who's protesting in opposition to you being out there? How, how would you say that? Um, uh, did it motivate you more? Did it make you not want to participate in, in protests? Um, so the other protests I've been to actually were women's marches where there weren't any counter protesters present. It was kind of a different environment. Um, so it was an interesting comparison between those two experiences that I've had. It was, it made me a lot more angry in a way, the constant presence sort of, and it's also kind of uncomfortable because um, uh, there were actually not in the protest that I attended, but in Asheville, uh, there were counter protesters present with uh, assault rifles, um, which was kind of worrisome for my family, knowing that I'm going to attend these protests and then for myself, just for my personal safety. So there's always that kind of uh, thought or fear in the back of your head that's very different from just attending a protest that's just um, all of you being gathered. Uh, so it was uh, definitely sort of a different environment, but also kind of, very reaffirming of my beliefs and like I definitely like felt very deeply like that I knew what I was standing for in direct comparison to the counter protesters if that makes sense. 
Mm -hmm. It does. It does. Absolutely. And you say you participated um, in the second protest with your family. Is, yes. Uh, is, is that an unusual thing? Was that the first time to do that or? Yes, actually, that was the first time I did that. Uh, the past protests that I fit, uh, attended were all with friends um, my age. So it was it was interesting um, attending with my mom. That was that really warmed my heart, sort of. But then especially I was with my 15 year old little sister um, and I attended personally my first protest when I was 16 or 17, so a little bit older than her. Um, and I personally really enjoy having these kind of conversations with her and sort of opening up the idea of activism to her. So I felt like that was a really good ex like experience to attend that together and kind of to be able to talk about that and process it afterwards. Because I feel like um, there's lots of great benefits to protest, but also educational benefits. So as a high school freshman, I feel like she definitely um, gained a lot from that. And I was just kind of, I was just really proud of like my family being together in a sense. So that was a great experience for me. Uh-huh. Great. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Amelia, for your um, story. And um, I'm sure I'll have other questions as will uh, perhaps others. Um, so thank you. Um, I think uh, we'll go ahead and um, transition to Simone. Simone, um, do you want to go ahead? Are you with us? Can you see me okay? And can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Simone. Hi, because you guys were breaking up for me a little bit, so I just want to make sure that you can hear me, okay? Yep, I can hear you pretty good. Um, okay. So if you just want to um, take a moment and just introduce yourself, and um, you also spent some time right over the summer um, participating in protests, I think in a couple of different areas, and like um, Amelia's, uh, yours were all in Florida, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and then talk about some of your activities, that would be great. Okay. Hi, my name is Simone. I'm a sociology um, major. I'm a junior and I'm 19 and I've been protesting for maybe the past like four or five months. And I, it started out about like a three times a week thing. Um, I protest with my sister. And it was a lot more often, like three to four times a week, sometimes every day, just in Orlando or Jacksonville, just all over. So I was really, um, I was really excited when um, Shai Morris, that's her name, the organizer of the protest I'm going to talk about, and she's out of New Smyrna Beach, and she's an artist, and she's really incredible. And so when she started organizing these um, New Smyrna Beach peaceful protests, I was really excited because New Smyrna Beach is a it's rather small and um, not very anti-racist and pro-speaking up town. It's very, very white and very old. So I was happy to be able to get out there and, you know, yell. And so um, it began every single Sunday from about 4 to 5. And it was the most peaceful protest I've ever been to. Um, peaceful as in, like, the Black Lives Matter crew was um, predominantly white and older and everyone, a lot of hand painted signs. Like it was very artsy and calm and just really nice, like no anger. It was just really great. And there was still passion, but it was just, there was a more mellow tone to this protest. And um, so that was really wonderful to experience. And then a few weeks in to this protest, we started getting like like some counter protesters and I'm pretty sure it started with one group that they call themselves paint the Trump and they have like a Facebook group and so they decided to come and wave their flags and yell on the other side of our corner that we have been protesting on for the past few months or weeks and now they've been joined by like a few Facebook groups all together and so now every Sunday it's like a little less peaceful, a lot less peaceful because um, they come and they wave their flags and they also yell directly at us. So it's not like, like they're coming out of anger and they're very defensive and they're very, just really, really mad and hateful. And so they stand there and they yell at us and they have like three to five trucks of their, um, of like counter protesters who drive around and just, slow down at each of us and yell really, really rude things. And they like do that exhaust fume thing and they like spew that dust on people. And there are some children on our side. So that's a little upsetting too, because we would not do that to them, obviously. 
And um, yeah, so that's a little bit of my experience. A truck, um, there's one truck and he's very, very feisty and mad and very racist and rude. And he slows down to me every Sunday, like just me. And last Sunday, he told me to go back to my own country and to leave his alone. And the Sunday before that, he told me that maybe if I took my mask off and took my clothes off, people would listen to me. And so he's very, like, he's just terrible. And the police don't seem to really care. The police are definitely more on the counter protesters side. We've been gifted with one, maybe like two cops that we've had who have been really sweet and kind, but the rest are either with the counter protesters or they're just like silent and confused like deer in headlights. Like they just don't know what to do. So it's definitely been like a learning experience for me about New Smyrna Beach. It just reaffirms what I already felt about the town in itself, which is that everything I just said. And so that that's interesting. Like no, there's no new news, I guess. But yeah, it's been kind of sad to see our sweet little protest become like polluted with these people. And um, the counter protesters are mainly like 40 to 50 year old white men and they have humongous Trump flags. And some of their flags are like the pole is like a fishing pole. And then another flag, the pole is like a gun. And then some of their flags say like, you want to take my guns, like come and get it. And so they're just really like, they think that we are wanting to take something like that's how it feels is that we're over here like, hey, don't be racist you know, be nice. And they're just so like, they just feel so attacked. So that's so, been interesting to see just like how fragile they are, you know, um, and like how full of like this toxic patriotism they are. Yeah. So, so thank you for sharing your experiences, Simone. So you're describing what sounds like a very hostile situation where uh, you're like, you're cutting you know, out just a little bit. Oh, am I? Um, how about yeah. now? Can you hear me at all now? How about now? You on Dr. Jackson. It's, it's predominantly on her side. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I can. I can, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Simone, it sounds like um, what good. you described. Pretty good. Okay. Um, it sounds like what yeah. you've experienced um, feels pretty hostile. Is that correct? Um, and so my question on that is, yeah. um, does, do you um, or other protesters uh, feel the need to escalate in response to, or, you know, to sort of uh, match that, that tension? Or do you tend to just continue with your message? And if so, I would ask, um, how do you manage to maintain your composure uh, no. in, those, in that setting? Yeah. I... I, um, I don't feel the need to personally interact with these, um, with the counter protesters. Like when the guy drove by me, I did, I didn't say anything. I just kind of stood there like, hmm, okay. Um, I think the only time I would engage is if they were going to hurt somebody on our side. Like for example, last Sunday, they were shouting, um, they were shouting very loudly directly at a black man on our side. One of the only black man on our side. Um, it's been it's been a pretty light crowd, which I think is wonderful. But he was out there the whole time with his sign, and they were yelling at him. And then um, when he went to walk back to his car, about five counter protesters pointed at him and started to follow him. And so me and my sister and two of our friends, we ran, we ran to him and we walked with him to his car. And then when we ran over there two of those counter protesters kind of backed up and then the others just kind of followed quietly but didn't they didn't do anything they didn't say anything and they didn't touch him they just looked at us like they were like like they were scared just it was really it was really weird like it was really uncomfortable because of how uncomfortable they seemed to be like mm -hmm. close to us so i don't think i don't think there is a good reason to really engage with them and i don't i don't feel tempted to because they're just mean, like they're just really angry and really mean. So I think the only, yeah, 
I don't think it would help. Mm -hmm. And well, they yell at young people. Like there's a lot of young women on our side who are in high school or in middle school that they directly shout at. So I don't think. Okay. Wow. That sounds like you definitely are having to use a lot of courage to be out there, Simone, fighting for what you believe in. Um, did you have anything else to share um, before I, I move on to um, Um, I don't have anything else to share about um, New Smyrna Beach protests, but um, that is the only one that has been difficult and disgusting. Like the protests in, Her in Orlando have been just wonderful and so many people, so many young people. And there was also a children's march that was um, put together in Orlando and there was like chalk and a lot of um, like children's dance teams came and there were poets and speakers and it was a, it was just a really nice environment. So, yeah, so that, that's it. Thank you, Simone. Uh, and I'm, I'll be back around with some other okay. questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so our final presenter for today um, uh, in this panel is Tommy. All right, you thank you. Us? Thank you, Simone. Tommy, are you with us? Just going to give a moment to see that connection go. Am I, um, is Tommy available right now? Having some, there he goes. Oh, there he goes, okay. Hi, Tommy. Okay, glad that you could join us uh, this afternoon. It's good to see you. Um, do you hear me okay? Oh, looks like we have, uh, we're not, we're not hearing you, Tommy. We're going to give that just a second. Um, while that's working out, I'm going to go ahead and just um, uh, say a couple things about Amelia and um, Simone. I think um, while they have um, very uh, different kinds of um, stories and experiences about being out there protesting, I think um, we can see um, many of the elements um, in thinking about being courageous that I mentioned um, from that Psychology Today article. Um, certainly needing to find heart or passion um, to go out and to, to do something that's difficult and stand up uh, for, for um, what is right. Um, and uh, I commend both of them for being able to um, walk past. Um, Amelia talked about being able to walk past people with assault rifles um, and to stand in the presence of uh, what sounded like a, a pretty um, intense situation of a bell ringing. I can imagine that being like some kind of um, town bell um, and the ways in which um, that that could have been intimidating. And of course, Simone, um, with her uh, tireless um, effort at going out um, uh, on the weekends and standing on the corner and having to endure um, some what sounds pretty awful behavior um, as she stands um, for racial justice. And so um, definitely commend both of those, um, uh, our, our, our Stetson students. Um, Tommy, how about any luck yet? Can, can you say something? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna see if Chris, 
Is there some he way definitely which... having technical difficulties? Um, okay. I'm not. He can show his video, but he can't show his audio. Can't show audio. Um, Tommy, can you leave and come back? Can he leave and come back? Try leaving and coming back. Okay, so Tommy's going to step out. Um, while we do that, Lamario, have you had a chance to look in the chat at all? Is there any? Are there any questions that come up that um, we might offer um, to our other other panelists while we're waiting for Tommy to resume to come back into the room? Yes, I have been monitoring, and I don't see any questions that have come up yet. I do you see some comments? Uh, no questions, though. Okay. D did you have any questions, that, um, or do you want to solicit? Does anyone have a question for one of our panelists right now? So I don't see anyone typing any, just to let okay. you know. That's fine. All right, so I still have Amelia and Simone um, um, on. Oh, wait. Are we working we're... now? Yes, we've got oh, Tommy. Goodness. All right. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna transition back to Tommy. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. McCray, uh, for that. If you can, if you see something else in the chat, I guess we'll come back. And if anyone has a question uh, for any of our panelists, please put it in the chat. And we will have time uh, for them to um, answer some questions. Um, yeah. Tommy, um, thank you for joining us um, this afternoon. And uh, I just, uh, you've had um, Amelia, um, who talked about um, participating um, in two different protests um, with different levels of um, engagement from counter protesters. Simone, um, who goes out uh, pretty much um, every week and, and engages uh, in protests where there's counter protesters in, um, in Florida. And so, um, yeah, so if you don't mind introducing yourself, um, tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, and then uh, your experience, I think it was uh, one, you've been to one protest, is that right? Uh, I've been to two, but I'm going to talk about one of them, yeah. Sure, go ahead, Tommy. Yeah, so my name is Tommy, Tommy Casey. I am a communications major here at Stetson. I'm on the football team as well as ROTC. And I'm from Naples, Florida, Southwest Florida. I have been to two, I participated in two Black Lives Matter protests. And I'm going to be talking about one of them, which was about three months ago. And so I, went, I had the opportunity to go with one of my best friends who is half Jamaican and half Korean. Uh, I've known him for about three years and he has taught me a lot, especially recently. Uh, I've grown up in a predominantly uh, white area. And so my, I've definitely learned a lot from him. And so the, we had planned on going about a week before and a couple days, before it was planned to start, we received word that there was going to be a counter protest, which was going to be an all lives matter protest at the same exact spot. And so we got there as soon as it started, there was probably about a hundred people, probably 50 on each side. So it was pretty even. And we immediately went to the front. We wanted to be right in the middle of it and try to talk to these people to kind of gain their perspective and try to be as understanding as possible. And so we immediately went up to the front and as soon as we got up there, we immediately just started getting yelled at and threatened. And so it was kind of like, kind of crazy to begin with. And, you know, we were trying to have just a peaceful conversation with some of these people and try to gain some of their perspective, but, they were saying some some pretty hurtful things, not only to me, but to a lot of my really good friends that I care a lot about. And they were uh, pretty similar to the two speakers that spoke earlier. They were, you know, telling all these people to go back to where they came from and saying all these hurtful things. And then uh, to me specifically, I was one of the few Caucasian people there. And so they were telling me that I'm on the wrong side and that I shouldn't be on that side and that I should be with them doing what they're doing. And a lot of people, had a lot of people threaten me and try to hurt me. 
but there was a lot of law enforcement there. And similar to, I forget which one said it earlier, but the police were only facing us, which was kind of interesting. I didn't even notice it until one of my friends pointed out where it, it almost seemed like they were protecting the All Lives Matter uh, protesters from us. And one of the things that was really eye-opening for me was just seeing how caring the people were that I had the, the opportunity to protest with. There was a really big storm that rolled in later on that day. It was about an hour in. And all the, the Black Lives Matter protesters, they had these big tents set up. And as soon as the rain started, they just they welcomed everyone underneath it. And they were handing out masks, handing out food, handing out water. And they didn't really care which side you were on. They, they were going to look out for you either way. And it was just it was really cool to see because, you know, obviously there's there's this perception from the media that shows the most radical of each side and it goes both ways. But I definitely did not see any of that. And it was it was just a really cool experience because, you know, being right there with them, right there next to them and you really saw uh, how caring they were and how much passion they had uh, in their hearts, not only for them, but for everyone else around them. It just, it meant a lot. So it was a really cool experience for me. Okay. Thank you for that one, um, Chris. I think, uh, I'm, I'm curious, you said something um, at the beginning that you went in uh, to the middle and near the front of the, um, I'm sorry, Tommy. Uh, I'm still getting Chris's name wrong. Uh, Tommy, you went to the front of the, um, or near the front of the panel, um, or panel. Now I'm really getting confused. The protest, um, because you wanted to talk to the protesters. What is it that you wanted to say to them? Yeah, so, I mean, growing up, I grew up in a very conservative family. And so when I was young, that's what I was taught, and that's what I believed. And you know, everyone's different, everyone grows up differently. And I think the way that the way that we act and the, the type of person that we are depends a lot on how we grow up. And so, like I said, when I was young, I grew up with those kind of views. And as I kind of learned on my own, instead of just taking what kind of my parents and my older siblings taught me, uh, it changed a lot of my views and they became my own, so I made them my own. And so I was, I wouldn't say I was in their position, but I was similar to what they believed. And my thoughts and views have changed a lot, especially over the past two years. And I, I think a lot of that comes with empathy. I think there's a lot of, there's just a lack of empathy in today's society, I think. And so, again, like my, one of my best friends, he's taught me a lot about empathy. And so, the reason I went to the front of there is because I have been in kind of a similar situation where I had maybe shared some of those views with them. And I know that people can change and firsthand experience. Like I know that people can change because I know I did. And so I wanted to gain a better understanding of why they think the way that they do. Like if it is, you know, the way they grew up or the way they truly think about people. Because I think, I think the number one thing for us to gain empathy is to understand each other. And so that in our minds was the best way that we could go about it is to go right up front and just talk with these people. Cause there's, there's no use in yelling back and forth. You know, if you want to sit down and talk about it, then I think that's a lot more helpful. And so that's what we were trying to do. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to go back uh, to Dr. McCray. Uh, how's that? How is that Q and A coming along? Hey, so we do have a couple of questions coming up. So um, first, uh, Chesia asks, "What helped you change your views, Tommy?" Ooh, it's a tough question. There's a lot, I think there's a lot that goes into that. So, like I said earlier, I. Well, I've I've moved a lot around a lot. Uh, when I was young, I grew up in a family that I grew up in a really big family. I have eleven siblings, 
and we moved around a lot until we finally ended up in Florida. And I actually, I graduated high school in 2019 and then I decided to take a postgraduate semester for football. And when I went off, it was a school from Virginia. So I moved up this past fall. And when I lived up there, it, it was the most diversity that I've ever been a part of. Like I met people from all over the world and I got to hear everyone's story. And I think, I mean, we talk about this in our class, Dr. Jackson, uh, storytelling and how important it is to understand each other. And, you know, prior to that, I, I grew up around people that were so similar to me and we all shared very similar stories. And when I finally was able to hear other people's stories, it made me a lot more pathetic towards them. And it made me understand why they think the way they do, because they grew up very differently from how I grew up. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that, thank you. Thank you for that, Tommy. That, that's, that's a super important point. Um, I wanna shift over to Amelia. Amelia, you talked about going um, to protest uh, and it also being a family affair. Um, did you have a very different kind of background growing up um, than Tommy? Um, so uh, racially, uh, you identify as white, white. That, yeah. yes, right? So um, Black Lives Matter protests, you know, mom, sister, family affair, how, how does that come about? So a little background with me, um, my dad is actually a professor of sociology at Elon University. Um, so as I said before, I'm a sociology major and I kind of grew up not even under knowing what sociology was, but sort of like that was sort of the fundamentals of my values in a way. Um, so my mom and my dad both raised me on very progressive uh, values and like uh, basically from like a really young age just taught me to treat everyone kindness on like a fundamental level. And uh, so different from Tommy, uh, my parents definitely share and encourage my views. And like I mentioned, like that's why my mom and my sister came with me and they were very much in support of all of it. Um, the only worries my mom had were about um, like attacks or like riots or something like that. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my background. And then I personally uh, started from a pretty young age, like 12 or 13, really getting into activism and really doing my own personal research because I didn't want to just be like taught by and influenced by my family. I wanted to like do my own thinking and like form my own opinions and uh that basically just kind of led me back around in a circle uh to my dad and my mom's teachings um but you know that was definitely a very different experience um from tommy because they my family's definitely been very encouraging of uh all of my activism since all this started all right thank you for sharing that amelia simone i'm just going to check in really quick with your family background are you with us still simone i knew you had some connection. Simone with us. Hi. Hi, Simone. Um, Can did you, you hear, hear me? I don't see you, but I hear you. Ah, there you are, Simone. I'm sorry. I don't know why this connection stuff is happening. It says strong, but it's fine. Okay. Um, so Tommy and Amelia both talked about their family's influence um, on them and is in relationship to their participation in Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you yourself, um, uh, how do you identify, Simone? I know racially and ethnically are very different, correct? Racially white yeah. and ethnically? Um, well, I guess it depends on who's asking. Sure. And what I think they'll um, take. I don't usually, I don't usually, I never say white okay. because it doesn't make sense to look at. I usually say Egyptian because my father, he's um, from Egypt and my mom is white. So I say Egyptian American or Arab American. It really depends on who's asking and yeah, and why. Um, so yeah, um, what was the second part of that? Sure. And so why, you know, how has your family influenced your participation in or not in um, in this activist work that you do? 
in fighting for black lives? Okay, well, um, so my father, he is a, um, he's an immigrant. He came here from Egypt. Um, so his life as a Muslim immigrant trying to make a life here has been really hard. And so his motto is kind of like just hide, like don't tell people you're Muslim, don't tell people he's an immigrant, make sure you talk about how your mother is white, make sure you tell everyone you're American, you don't, you just don't speak about it because you don't want to get shot. So that's his, that's his idea. So he hasn't been encouraging about protesting, but he's not also, he also hasn't been like, no, don't do that. But he's kind of just like, why? I don't understand. They're leaving you alone and you have the option to be left alone. Wouldn't you like to do that? And um, so that's just, that's been whatever. And um, my mom, she's, she's been supportive of it. She went to one protest. She's, um, she's artsy. She's interesting and she likes to do things. She went to one, only one, because why do it again if you've done it once, right? So that's kind of where she's at. But um, she's supportive of us, and she hates racism. She hates what she hates racism that she sees because she doesn't always. She's not always able to identify it because you know it, that happens. So, but yeah, it's been nice. My sister though, she's also a slam poet. So she does um, slam poetry, which is um, spoken word poetry, and she's a writer. And um, she's really similar to me in the way that we like to protest and we like to stand up for people. So she's been really supportive and we've kind of backed each other up. So that's been fun. All right, thank you for sharing, Simone. Hey, Dr. Jackson, just let me know, Lameryl here, that we have about three more questions that have come up. So when you're ready. Sure, no, that's fine. I will, uh, I will yeah. allow that, that to go and I will sit back. Okay. Um, let's see. So Madison asks for any of the panelists, any or all, uh, what advice would you have for allies who engage with counter protesters? Um, I can uh, answer that one if no one else wants to go. Uh, personally, my basic mindset for that, if you are uh, engaging with counter protesters, uh, the phrase I'm sure that we've all heard, when they go low, we go high. Um, don't let the words of others and the, the anger and the tension of the situation allow you, or like um, kind of cloud your vision as far as what you're there for. Like make sure you focus on the like your purpose the purpose of your presence there um and especially with the movements as big as this uh sort of ensure that it doesn't become a personal back and forth um as far as engaging with the counter protesters uh and personally i would try to limit that um yeah kind of going well are you done or, okay uh, kind of going along with that, I would say try not to be driven too much by emotion. It's very easy to react quickly with emotion. There was at one of the protests that I went to, the one that I talked about earlier, there was uh, when it began storming and, you know, the All Lives Matter protesters were starting to come under the tent. There was one of the protesters that was on the Black Lives Matter side that I uh, reacted very quickly out of emotion and they were like, no, like, what are you doing? Get out. And then everyone else around them was like, no, no, no. Like we're here, you know, for everyone, uh, and equality. And so, you know, and then once she realized that she kind of took a step back and was able to have some empathy, even towards the people that are protesting against them. And so I would say, again, try not to react too quickly out of purely emotion. All right, so I will, Simone, did you want to go ahead? Simone, yeah, um, I was, okay, go ahead. That, I agree with all of that. I think that was really helpful. I would just add on, so 
to just make sure that you are mentally prepared for what you might hear and what you might go through. That's been something that's helped me this every single protest we've gone to. It's been a little bit easier and easier to ignore comments and things like that if you are mentally prepared and you have the mental space to like take some comments. So I think it's nice to just you know, like know what you're going into and make sure you're not going into it by yourself. That's also been helpful. Thank you. So I'll continue, Dr. Jackson, unless you let me know otherwise. Or um, let's see. So Susan asked, um, this is specifically for uh, Tommy, I believe. Um, have you shared your changed views with your family, the views that you talked about earlier? Uh, yeah, so my views of they they didn't really change drastically, you know, they came over time. And so I think I actually saw in the chat earlier that somebody was from Davidson College, which is actually where three of my older siblings went. And that school actually changed their views a lot as well, which had an effect on me because I was able to learn from them uh, when I was younger. And yeah, I mean, my whole family knows about my views now. I've I try to be as public as I can with my views and try to reach as many people as I can. So they definitely know about how my views have changed and actually a lot of their views have changed with me. And so uh, most of my, actually all of my older siblings, their views have changed now. Uh, I would say a few of my younger siblings have too. And I think my parents are actually in the process of changing some of their views. They, you know, they taught us very differently than where I'm at now, which is, uh, which I'm proud to say, because now they're my views. Uh, they're not shaped by other people and I've, I've made them my own. So yeah, they definitely, they definitely know uh, my views now. Thank you, Tommy. Um, another question that's come up for all of our panelists, do you see connections between Black Lives Matter and other social justice issues? Um, I can speak on that. Uh, personally, I think that across the board, it's, uh, it's going to be easier for someone who is outside of that targeted group to like voluntarily place themselves in this sort of activism and advocate for others and what I mean by that is like I'm white um and I'm not going to have the same experiences in my daily life or at the protests as those who are being directly affected by these issues um so that's kind of similar to you know men going to women's marches and such like that so I feel like across the board uh, that's definitely a factor as far as like participants and the, the variations of experiences, uh, within these protests. Um, and that's also just something to keep in mind. Like I, like I said, like I'm, I personally identify like as an activist and I, uh, have lots of passions and opinions about lots of different issues. Um, but all of those affect me or don't affect me in different ways. So that's kind of all like different perspectives in a way. Thank you, Amelia. So I'll, I'll go on to Sarah's question. Um, have your experiences at protests affected other areas of your life? For example, relationships, friendships, classes, and I think some of you have um, spoken to this to some degree. Um, whoever's ready. Yeah, I can, I can speak on that first. So I would say that it, it has definitely changed uh, different aspects of my life. Like I've said earlier, and I've mentioned this a lot already, but it's made me a lot more empathetic and because of that, it's made me 
actually become a lot closer with the people that I know and even my family. It's made me a lot more understanding of what other people go through because I think before I experienced some of those things, I didn't think about what people go through in the same way because obviously we all grow up differently. We all have different experiences. We all go through different struggles. And so I would say it's, it's definitely affected my friendships. I've become a lot closer with the people that I care about because of it. So. I, uh, I can also speak on that. Okay, someone you want to go ahead and then we'll hear from Amelia? You said I could go ahead? I'm sorry. Oh, sure, sure, go ahead. Yes, Simone. Okay. Um, so as far as um, like activist type work, yes, I can hear you. And protesting affecting other relationships and personal life, I think it definitely can. Like I quit and I quit and left a weightlifting team that I had been on for five years like since I was like 15 years old and I'm about to be 20. So that was, that was a, that's a long time. And it was just simply because they were really, really racist and sexist and just horrible. So that also goes back to how it relates to other social issues. Like I can't really talk about racism without bringing up sexism. And so I think it definitely relates to other social issues and it relates to it seeps into all of your personal relationships because they're like these are your beliefs and they get very personal and they kind of become like it's also kind of a lifestyle to kind of live by these morals and the ways that we feel so yeah i agree with what you said too tiny Thank you, Simone. Amelia? Sure. So personally, um, sort of going broader than my experiences at protests, just sort of like my experiences with the current events, uh, especially of this year, um, affecting other areas of my life. Um, it's been very interesting seeing sort of Instagram activism being becoming more popular and that really bringing to light um, a lot of the views of people that I've known for years and years that I've never um, seen speak up in one side or another about uh, issues such as these. So it's been interesting kind of learning more about the people that I say like went to high school with or grew up with. Um, and it's interesting seeing where I have allies and where I can kind of see where people might want to become more educated on certain things. Um, it's just interesting kind of everyone sort of learning together about this and sort of just kind of seeing the views of the people that I've known for so many years. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jackson, if you're there, um, thinking about time, and we have about three more questions that have come up. So I'm curious, shall we address these three and yeah, let's go ahead and take those questions. Um, if anyone has any final thoughts um, that need to go in the chat, go ahead and get them in. We'll take um, a last set round of questions. Maybe we'll go about five minutes over. Um, if that's okay with our presenters, are you all good with that? Works. Okay, great. Um, so the question uh, Sam asked, this is specifically for Simone. Are there um, American Muslims, Arab Americans who inspire you in your activism? And if so, how? Yes, there are. There are, there are a lot actually, which is really cool. I think I was actually writing an answer to that so that I could like list out names for them to find. But um, I won't talk about like individual people, but on 
Instagram, for example, you can find a lot of accounts that is like the Queer Muslim Project or one that's just called Muslim, and it's just a lot of, and those accounts incorporate like the views and the work of hundreds of activists, like young people too, of all ages, and so that's really wonderful because I've always viewed kind of being openly Muslim in an area this is activism in itself because it's really hard and you get a lot of um, a lot of people are overly entitled to telling you how to feel and what to do and telling you what your life must be like and what you must think. So I think that just speaking about it um, and not being afraid of what people might say and try and tell you about yourself is activism in itself. And there are a lot of people that um, you can find if you just look them up. But I can put some of their names in there, some of my favorites, if you would want me to. So thank you. Oh, yeah, I really love your idea, too, Simone, if you want to share um, in the chat. Um, all right, so Chesia asks, uh, do you think that it's easier to not um, make personal or be emotional if your humanity is being challenged, um, is, if it's not being challenged? So the way, for instance, they targeted and followed the black protester. I had kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, um, talking about my experiences or mentioning my experiences as a white person at a Black Lives Matter protest. Um, I think it's definitely uh, something to consider the fact that uh, it's if it's less uh, personal to you, the the motivations behind your presence and the the reality that you're able to face uh, regarding the protests is going to be very different. And I think it's really for people who are not of color who are attending um, protests like these need to be very conscious of their privilege um, and their power, um, but also using that to boost the voices of others um, who are in attendance. Uh, but I definitely think that it's uh, kind of circling back around easier um to not to kind of like shut just like because we sort of have an option just to shut off um uh the connection that we're creating in a way if that makes sense um so yes i think it's easier not to uh make personal or be emotional um when you're not directly affected by these things yeah and kind of piggybacking off of that as far as you know the use of privilege i I know that I have never feared for my life because of the color of my skin. And I think for me personally, that's something that I can use uh, to help people that don't live that way and that can't live that way. And so for me, you know, going to a protest and going right into the middle of it, I, I, I don't fear any, anything as far as the color of my skin, but I know that the people next to me do. And so because I can live that way, I want to be able to fight for other people that can't live that way yet. And so I don't have people telling me to go back to where I came from or any of these other things, but I think it's important to use that, that privilege to help people that don't have it yet, so. Thank you, Amelia and Tommy. I think we have one more question that came up. So this is for uh, you, Tommy. How has your experience as an athlete affected your views on structural racism in the US? All right, so there's a lot that I could go into with that. So growing up, like I said, I, I never really grew up in a very diverse setting and so for me, football and other sports, I ran track, I played basketball uh, growing up. But for me, sports was always the most diverse thing that I was a part of. And it was the place where I could meet all these different kinds of people. And so sports has helped me a lot, especially over the past year when I went off to postgraduate school and I 
met all these people from around the world. And I think, you know, looking back four years ago when specifically with football and Kaepernick first taking a knee, uh, like I said earlier, my views were very different. And I can say that, like, I was one of the people that didn't like that because I didn't fully understand why. And I had people that were in the military and I viewed it as something that was just disrespectful. But my views have changed a lot and they're the complete opposite of what they were. And I, I'll try not to get too opinionated about it, but you know, for me being a part of ROTC here at Stetson, I can safely say that I am not joining to protect a piece of fabric, but uh, to protect the freedom that these people have everyone in America and you know that freedom in my mind is not equal yet and so I think other people should definitely have the right to fight for that too and that's why these people are, are doing what they're doing so I think football has helped a lot with that thank you all right. Well, I am uh, going to honor the time. I know we already went over time, so uh, in some ways that didn't happen. Um, I'm going to say thank you, Tommy, Amelia, Simone. You guys um, really did an excellent job uh, coming with your stories and sharing them in the uh, with our community. Um, and for anyone else who has the link and uh, will listen to this at an, a later time, um, and thank you to everyone who uh, came and um, supported our presenters today uh, and participated in the um, chat and listened to these stories. Um, as a reminder, this is the first of a week series that we're doing this semester. Uh, and so uh, that's talking about race in the 21st century. Uh, and so each week uh, we'll have a different set of panelists. Um, and so, again, if you know someone who might have been, been unable to attend today, uh, do look for the link on this. Um, I encourage I encourage them to listen. I think these were very powerful stories, um, stories of courage, uh, and so much more. So uh, thank you, everyone, for your time today. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Dr. Jackson. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. I'm glad you made it. I was a little worried there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got you in. I'm not sure what the issue is. Yeah, just in time. That's right. Thank you, guys. You guys were great. You knocked it out. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. It was wonderful. Y'all you. You have a good guys, one. Yeah, you guys too. Sign off. Go enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Um, yeah.